the working title of my book is uh, At Home in the World, California Women in the Environmental Movement. And uh, the main argument of the book is that uh, women in California really revamped and reshaped the environmental movement which had existed in California since their early 1890s um, when John Muir and, and some of his colleagues and friends created the Sierra Club. Um, and, that's, and, and then for many years after that, um, the environmental movement was basically called the conservation movement. And uh, it mostly focused on the wilderness and preserving wilderness areas for hiking, uh, for hikers and campers. Women were involved in the Sierra Club, but they were not, they didn't, didn't have leadership positions. They were hikers, they were campers. Um, there are some really interesting stories about women uh, in California in particular who, who rode the train from, from San Diego to Lindsay, California or other places near the eastern part of the Sierras and they hiked up and backpacked up into the wilderness. Um, they didn't wear pants, they had to wear skirts when they did this. And these are quite interesting women, uh, but they were not in leadership positions. They were just members of the, of the Sierra Club who, who hiked and backpacked um, with the men. Well, they started to, uh, and this was in the 1960s when they became more involved. And it was, it was because the, the, the problems in California after World War II were, were, were just unbelievable. You had smog, you had over, overbuilding, you had the San Francisco Bay, which was, being, um, which was being a, a dump, becoming a dumping ground for, uh, for cities and counties. Uh, you had the beginning of nuclear power in the state. Uh, California was seen as a place where, uh, a very promising place for nuclear power because it had, has an 1,100 mile coastline. And so, uh, so PG&E and other, uh, other energy companies could, could build uh, nuclear power plants in California along the coastline. Um, in, in Southern California, you had really serious overbuilding uh, when all the, all the flatlands were taken up in the 1950s. Um, the builders started looking to the Santa Monica Mountains, which had been pristine and, and basically open, open space until the 1950s. Uh, you had fires there and floods caused by the overbuilding, and so, uh, and so there were quite a few new and different problems. And the, the existing uh, establishment organizations didn't, just didn't have really the, the ability to, or, or, the, or the desire to, to really focus on these new issues. Well, one of the women I focused closely on was Kathleen Goddard Jones, who lived most of her life in Santa Barbara and in San Luis Obispo County. Um, quite early on, she was, I, I wouldn't say she was necessarily a rebel, but she was an adventuresome person from her childhood. Um, an example would be that when she was 19 years old, she decided to travel to Europe with some friends of hers. And, uh, and so uh, some, of, uh, some of the research that I did uh, was covered some letters that she wrote home to her family. Paris, gay, mad, intoxicating Paris, at last, and I shall live here always. And then underneath she writes, she, she prints, when my ship comes in. Uh, this letter appears to be mostly uh, aimed at her mother, uh, who she apparently thinks is sort of a fuddy-duddy. Uh, a mother, about your asking me not to take wine, at first I was absolutely astounded. And then I stopped and remembered that you know nothing about other countries, nothing. And the more I thought of that, the absurdity of your asking me not to take wine, why, the more I understood that I would have to try to tell you a little bit about this foreign world. Wine is as water here and is served with the meal without extra charge. It is unsafe to drink water in Italy and France, so they never think of serving water. So uh, she's 19 when she's writing these letters, which tells you uh, quite a bit about, you know, she has a very strong sense of self. Her major involvement, uh, what, what makes her uh, a topic, a subject that I really wanted to pursue for this book is that she is largely responsible all by herself for stopping the, the creation or the development of a power, nuclear power plant on this pristine part of the coast um, called the Nipomo Dunes. And um, the PG&E had plans to build a power plant there uh, going back to the, to the 1950s. And uh, she learns about this in the early 1960s and she becomes devoted to, to stopping this power plant, the creation of this power plant in San Luis Obispo County. Virtually everybody in San Luis Obispo County wants this power plant 
because it's going to mean tax revenue, it's going to mean jobs, it's going to be money for schools, money for businesses, and so virtually everyone uh, really favors the creation of this power plant. And so PG&E thinks basically that it has free reign to do this, even though just a little bit earlier up the coast in Bodega Bay, north of San Francisco, uh, a group of local activists stopped the power plant there. But that happened because they, just, they found a, a seismic issue there. They found a, a, an earthquake fault uh, right off the coast, which, which made it impossible to build the plant there. So they turned instead to, uh, to Nipomo and decided that they wanted a plant there instead. So this was quite, an, quite a, a, a difficult prospect for her. Um, she loved to hike on the dunes. Uh, she loved, she, she hiked by herself there, she led hikes there, she took her children on hikes to the dunes, and she just became determined virtually overnight that she was going to stop the creation of this plant. Um, so that's the beginning of her activism um, in San Luis Obispo County. She won by virtually alienating almost everybody in the, in the, in the area, uh, which she didn't really care about. Uh, what happened was that she, that she learned of this effort, and so she began to attend meetings of city council meetings, board, board of supervisors meetings. Uh, every meeting that she could find in which they discussed the dunes, she would dress up in her pearls and her heels and her, and her suit, and, and she would go to the meetings. And uh, she, she hated wearing this kind of clothes, I should tell you. She mostly wore, jean, mostly wore pants. Uh, she wore a, uh, she carried a, a water bottle on her, on her waistband. Uh, she had a walking stick. Uh, she, she never wore dresses. But she had to dress up for this, and then she would give these talks before the city council, um, before all these bodies, these governmental bodies, she would give talks. And no one agreed with her at all. And at one of these meetings, uh, there were some representatives from PG&E and she asked to be introduced to them. And so she made friends with one of the people there, a guy who was a, a public relations person there, and, uh, and she tried to convince him individually to, to try to move the power plant somewhere else. And so she basically just put that idea in his head that, that she wasn't opposed to nuclear power in general, she was just opposed to having it on the Napomo dunes. And so the pl they asked her where she would recommend, uh, and she recommended a place about 25 miles north of the dunes, a canyon called Diablo Canyon. And, um, and she thought it was what she called a slot canyon, which had no charm and had no special, nothing special about it. And so PG&E agreed to do this. And, um, and so she took this to the board, of, of the board of the Sierra Club, and they voted in favor of it and everything seemed fine. This was 1965. And, um, and this unleashed basically a civil war um, in the Sierra Club because some members of the Sierra Club were adamantly opposed to, um, to nuclear power at all. Others knew Diablo Canyon and thought it was a beautiful place and they shouldn't build anything there. So, uh, so the Sierra Club really was torn by this, and she was blamed by, by a lot of the Sierra Club uh, leaders for, for creating this mess. And, um, and so basically what happened was over the next few years, there were votes, there were, there were conflicts. Um, uh, the conflict cost David Brower, who was the executive director of the Sierra Club, his job. She never, she never um, got back her status in the Sierra Club. People were very angry with her. Um, but she just continued to work after this to get national park and state park status for, for the Nipomo dunes. Well, I argue in the research project that women sort of forced the environmental movement to, 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 to expand, uh, to move in different directions, that it's difficult when you have a long-standing movement like the conservation movement in California and elsewhere to get people who've been involved for quite some time and have an agenda to basically look outside that, that agenda. And so my argument in, in the book is that these women really forced the men who led these groups to look outside of, of these particular, of their narrow agenda and, and focus on issues that were really, uh, really troublesome in California in the post-World War II period. So the last 
chapter of the book, I look at something called the environmental justice movement, um, which is very, very strong today. And um, if these women uh, force the men to look outside of their own comfort zones, um, the people who are involved in the environmental justice movement today, who were African American, uh, Latina, and, and I should say these movements are also largely led by women, um, force the environmental movement as a whole to look outside of its comfort zone, you know, these white areas like, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area um, or the Santa Monica Mountains where, where people of color couldn't really afford to live. Um, these are expensive homes up there. And, um, and the dunes, it's, it's phenomenal that the dunes have been saved, but still, you know, people who live in towns like Wilmington, uh, in, in Los Angeles County, or Richmond, which is in the East Bay of, of um, the Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area, these people live under, you know, you know, with environmental threats all the time. So I think these women deserve a lot of credit, but, and they, they, they created this movement but that the movement has moved beyond them today to other, other um, issues 